In times of antiquity, light was a really mysterious thing. People didn't even know whether or not it had a speed. And it was Galileo who did one of the first experiments to see if it had a speed. He took a lantern and he set somebody else up with another lantern a little less than a kilometer away on top of a hill. And what he did was he blocked off the light on his lantern, instructed the other person to do the same. And then when he opened his lantern so they could see the light, they were instructed to do the same to their lantern. And what Galileo tried to measure was the time it took between when he unblocked his lantern to when he saw the light coming from the hilltop. And well, he was a great scientist. And as a result, he reported the result to be inconclusive. And it was because now we know that if his other lantern had been about half a mile away, well, the round trip time for light would have been about five microseconds. And there is no way he would have been able to measure it by human observation. Well, over the next few hundred years, astronomers started to notice anomalies in positions of planets and times of various events they observed being off just a little bit and from that deduced the speed of light to an accuracy of probably within about 25 percent of what we know it is today. So there was mounting evidence that light did indeed have a very real speed. And it wasn't until 1849 when a Frenchman Ippolit Fizeau did an ingenious experiment to actually measure the speed of light directly for the first time. And what he did was he set up a cogwheel and he had it spinning really fast and he shone a beam of light through the cogs to hit a mirror about eight kilometers away and reflect that beam of light back. And that reflection was set up to go right through those same cogs on the cog wheel. And if it took a certain amount of time for the light to get to the mirror on the hill and then come back, well, that meant that the cog wheel would have advanced a few degrees. So instead of the light coming through the exact position on the cogs where he had shot it out through the hill, it appeared to move a little bit in the direction of rotation of the cogwheels. And by looking how far, how many degrees the reflected beam appeared to move, and by knowing the speed he was rotating the cogwheel, he was able to calculate the speed of light. And he did that to within 5% of what we know it is today. His number was 315,000 kilometers a second compared to the 300,000 kilometers a second that it actually is. Well, you have to appreciate how hard it must have been for him to do that, having to probably custom build so much of the apparatus and figure it out all at the time when, well, there was very little technical equipment around. Today we can do it in a much easier way, and I've actually been experimenting for the last couple of weeks to try and figure out how to do this as simply and easily as possible and do it in a way that not only I can do it easily and cheaply in my basement, but you can too, either in your basement or a high school classroom or even a first or second year university lab. So what we're going to use is instead of a high speed spinning cog wheel, we're going to use a laser diode and that laser diode is going to be turned on and off at about a million times a second and we're going to send the beam to the other end of the basement and then receive it back with a photodiode and display the results on an oscilloscope screen and hopefully calculate the speed of light. So let's take a quick look at the experimental setup. We have the signal generator over there which is generating our 100 nanosecond pulse. And it's being fed through some wires to our laser diode right here. And that laser diode is in series with a one ohm resistor. And we're using that resistor to simply measure the current going through the laser diode. And the scope is connected to it. So the upper trace on the scope shows us the pulses we're feeding to the laser diode. 
that laser diode spews out a nice expanding beam of light which is going into this magnifying glass just a plain old dollar store magnifying glass which essentially focuses it way to the other end of the basement onto a mirror I have there and that mirror reflects the light back to this magnifying glass which once again focuses it onto this photo detector diode which is powered by a 9 volt battery and in series with a 1k ohm resistor and that 1k ohm resistor provides us a means of measuring the current through the photo detector diode and displaying that current on the lower trace on the scope and it's that peaked waveform at the bottom that's showing the pulse of light coming back. So let's get on with the experiment. The first thing we need to do is prove that the lower scan on the scope is indeed the result of the light leaving here going to the end of the basement and coming back and well if I put my hand in front of the transmit magnifying glass the waveform disappears and if I do the same thing for the receive one the waveform also disappears so indeed those peaks we're seeing are from the light at the end of the basement. Okay now what we really need is something to compare the position of those peaks with and what we're going to do is use a mirror and deflect the light from here over here to the photodiode and that will create a much shorter path and so the peak should be moved considerably to the left and well I'm going to have to play around with the mirror here and we should notice that happen. There is the peak. Now we could certainly use the computer to superimpose the two, but if I adjust the position of the mirror just right, I can get it to reflect back about half the beam of light coming from the magnifying glass and the laser diode. So half goes to the other end of the basement and produces the peak representing its time of arrival back. It's a somewhat smaller peak of course and now if I position the angle of the mirror just right we can see a second peak representing the about three foot round trip path of the light that's well going from the laser to the little nearby red mirror to the photodiode and if we look at the difference between those two peaks well that's essentially the time it took for the light to travel all the way to the other end of the basement and back and it's that difference in time that difference in time between the two peaks that we can use to calculate the speed of light and I did the same type of thing except with the probes connected to the digital scope to get a slightly different perspective on the same measurement and we'll compare the two results when we calculate the speed of light okay so let's see how we did well I've drawn a sort of schematic type depiction of our light path we have our laser diode here and our long path to the end of the basement which is and I measured it 57 feet so it goes all the way down here and then it comes back 57 feet again so the total path is 2 times 57 equals 114 feet and if you wonder why I'm using feet well with light like the speed of light is one foot per nanosecond so feet is a very convenient way of distance measuring when you're dealing with the speed of light anyway that's our long path over here and if we were to look at the pulse on the scope we would see this peak over here is the pulse that we sent on the long path and we also made a short path using a little mirror and the round trip on the short path is about three feet so the short path 
is three feet. So the, well, I shouldn't have used total path here, but the, the path difference between this peak and this peak is, so maybe we'll call it delta path or delta x for distance. That's 114 feet minus 3 feet equals 111 feet. So we would expect that the time difference between this peak from the short path and this peak from the long path, the two pulses, the time difference of arrival of those two pulses should be somewhere around 111 nanoseconds, a give or take. Now, if we look at the measurements on the scope, and I use both my digital scope and analog scope and tried to estimate the times, well, here's what I got. For the analog scope, and this is an analog scope that's probably about 40 years old and hasn't been calibrated in probably 25 years, well, the difference between these two peaks looked like 120 nanoseconds. And if we figure out the speed as a result of that, and remember the speed, we'll use C, the speed of light, equals delta x, or the delta path, over delta t. And it turns out that in fact, 111 feet is 33.8 meters and we'll divide that by 120 nanoseconds and when we do the conversions and all of that we end up with a speed that is 282,000 kilometers per second which is 6% low. Okay so maybe we'll just record that here, 282,000 kilometers per second, and it's minus 6%. Well, what happened when I did this with the digital scope? And there's nothing magical about the digital scope other than I think it's been calibrated more recently, but it's still pretty hard to sort of determine where those peaks are. Anyway, I came up with 105 nanoseconds. And again, if we crank through the calculations, this time we get 322,000 kilometers per second. And so that's really a plus 7% um, deviation from the accepted value. And the accepted value is very close to 300,000 kilometers per second. So that's actually not a bad result at all. I'm quite happy with that. And it's interesting to note that if we were to average these two values, well, we would certainly be doing a lot better. So there you go. We've measured the speed of light. We got to within six or seven percent of the actual value. And I'm quite thrilled with that because I was hoping we'd get within 10 percent and we certainly did better than that. And in fact, we could do even better if we had the mirror that we're using to reflect the light even further away. It's only about 50 feet away from our transmitter receiver setup. And of course, if we had it twice as far away or four times as far away or whatever, well, that would mean errors in trying to estimate the time between the two peaks in the short round trip and long round trip pulses would be a lot less significant. And therefore our calculations would probably be much more accurate. Now I'm going to do a follow-up video on this to go over the apparatus in more detail to give you the part numbers of the various devices that I used and also suggest some alternate ways of doing it so you can try and duplicate this experiment yourself either at home or in a high school classroom or a university lab. And I also want to talk a little bit about laser safety because that's also quite critical. So I hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time.